right, this is physics 1C for September 8th, first hour of class. Today we are going to be talking about electric fields. We're going to review what we did last time about Coulomb's law, and then we're going to get into the definition of electric fields, and then we're going to calculate the electric field for very various different types of things. So why should you care about what we're doing today? What is an electric field? Well, long ago, people were trying to figure out how to describe electricity. And there were a lot of different scientists that were working on this problem. Um, unlike gravity, where you can pretty much point to Newton and give Newton a lot of the credit for his theory of gravity and his theory of mechanics. You know, we call it Newtonian mechanics. There were other people doing experiments, right? I mean, Galileo had a lot to do with the development of Newtonian mechanics because he worked out a lot of the relationships before Newton needed to. So, in spite of that, you can pretty much point to Galileo and Newton as the predominant forces behind our understanding of classical mechanics. Electricity is much different. There were many different people working with electricity. People like Ben Franklin, who you probably have heard, uh, uh, you know, figured out that lightning is the same thing as electricity. At the time, they called it electrical fire. And Franklin was actually the first person to, to identify that there were two types, that there was positive and negative electricity. He was the first person to come up with that distinction. But you also had people like um, Galvani. I believe Galvani was the one that was doing it. Is that Galvani or Volta? Who were literally um, taking frogs, dead frogs, right? And they were giving them electrical shocks in different places on their body, and they were showing that the muscles of the frog could, could twitch and spasm as if it was alive when you applied electricity to them. So very different ideas. You've got lightning and you've got life, like the idea that you can use electricity to, to prod people back to life. And this idea was, was used by Mary Shelley in the book Frankenstein to talk about a monster that was a dead person that was, you know, reincarnated with electricity, right? In a way, tying together Franklin's idea of the lightning bolt with uh, Galvani's idea of like sparking a frog's legs moving and turning them into the Frankenstein's monster, right? So there's all these different people working at electricity. They're all trying to come up with ways to explain how it works, right? And eventually this guy named Faraday comes along. And Faraday is kind of like the best of the best when it comes to electric, electrical um, measurements and, and um, experiments. And he starts to just play with all types of different things in this laboratory. He comes up with all kinds of creative demonstrations. He even would hold um, demonstrations where he would describe to the public how these things would work. He'd, he'd put on these little scientific displays on Christmas and he would encourage children to come and he would show them all these fascinating things you could do with electricity. It had to be a really fascinating thing to be a child living in uh, England at that time and being able to attend one of these because you'd be seeing things that were completely groundbreaking, things that were not modern, that were not um, commonplace to you, right? Well. In, in, in working with all these different things, Faraday came up with this brilliant idea, which was to describe electricity in terms of what are called lines. He called them lines of force. Nowadays, we call them field lines. And that was the first um, development of this concept of the electric field. And that's what we're gonna discuss today, is, is the type of this idea that, that Faraday kind of came up with that allowed him to describe why it was that certain things happened with electricity, why it was that when you put certain things together, such and such thing would happen. And he used lines of force. And to this day, this is still how we describe electricity. And it turned out to be much more significant than even Faraday would have imagined. He was just trying to understand why certain experiments worked the way they did. And nowadays we know that this concept of the electric field is fundamental to our understanding of another idea Called light, visible light. They're inherently connected. So that's ultimately where this course is going to go, is we're going to develop the electric field today. And by the end of the course, you'll see that it's, it's not only a really helpful way to think about electricity, it's also a really helpful way to think about the way that light propagates through a vacuum. So um, it all starts here with the development of the electric field. And in order to do that, we need to revisit something we did last time. So last time we discussed forces, electric forces. We talked about how positive charges, if you place two positive charges near each other, that they're going to feel a force. They're going to be repelled from one another. And the size of the force, you know, if I take a charge, remember for charges, what do we use? We use Q for charge. So if I take a charge over here and I take a charge over here and I place them some distance apart from each other and I know what the distance between their centers is and we call it R, 
then we know that, let's say this is a positive charge, and let's say this is a positive charge, just to keep things simple, we know there's gonna be a repulsive force on this one and a repulsive force on this one that we call the electrical force. And the size of that force is given by this expression, K times Q1 times Q2 divided by the distance between them squared. This is what we learned about last time. We learned that it's a vector. We learned that, um, you know, the way your book does this is they put the absolute value signs in here. I'm not always gonna write the absolute value signs on here, but um, I always think when I write Q1, I just mean the magnitude of the charge, but um, anyway, so we, we learned about this. This is, this is called the electric force, the Coulomb force, Coulomb's law, whatever you wanna call it. Um, and this is gonna be the starting point for defining what an electric field is. Oh, Evan says, didn't he present himself almost like a magician? Yeah, he basically did these, these electric demos. I don't know if it was only electricity because I'm pretty sure I went back and looked at the, the list of the demos that he had. And I think he was doing some other things too, but yeah, he 100% presented it like he was a magician. Um, and um, the, the, we do this thing that is, I think, inspired by Faraday. I don't know if it's inspired by Faraday. I don't know who came up with the idea, but it certainly feels like it. Um, there's this thing called uh, Onizuka Science Day, which I don't know how long you all have been at El Camino, but I mean, when we were still in person, you, some of you maybe, had, were any of you involved in the last time we did Onizuka Science Day? I think it was in 2019, so I don't know if, God, that's so long ago, it's two years. But we basically do something similar to this at El Camino, where a couple of professors, I've done it a couple times, it's really fun. You just stand up in front of a bunch of like, I think it's like 12 to 14 year old kids from like uh, local like grades, uh, middle schools. And we give them all these like science teasers. It's super fun. Anyway, so getting back to this, Coulomb's law, we learned about this, right? So what we can do in terms of um, writing this in kind of a way that's gonna be more useful to us is we can say, suppose that I take some charge and we're gonna make it a positive charge. And we're gonna say it as a positive charge that I'm gonna call plus Q, okay? And I'm gonna to refer to this as my source charge. All right, my source charge, positive big Q. Now, what I can do is I can come over here to a point in space that's some distance away from this object. Let's call this point P. And I can ask the question, if I were to place a positive charge right here, what would the direction of the force on that charge be? Does that make sense? So suppose that I take another charge. We're gonna move it over here because we're gonna move it into place. So suppose I take a small charge. This one is going to have a charge that we're just gonna call uh, little q. Actually, we're gonna call it little q naught because I think that's usually what's done in most textbooks. We're gonna call this my test charge. And what we're gonna do with the test charge is we're gonna use it to probe what we call the electric field. We're gonna take our test charge and we can put it wherever we want to. I can put it down here. I can put it right here at the point P. I can put it right up here. And I'm just gonna put it at different positions and I'm gonna ask you to tell me the answer to the question. The question is, what direction is the force on the test charge, okay? I'll write that uh, right here. The electric field answers this question. At least the line part of it is. That's the question we want to answer, okay? So we take our test charge, right? And let's say I put it right here. And I ask the question, what's the, we're, we're not, we don't care about this one. The source charge is going to be fixed in place, okay? So I'm just gonna say below this, this is fixed in place. It's not movable, okay? It's just gonna stay there, it cannot move, okay? I place the test charge right here, right? What's the direction of the force on the test charge at this location? Is it up, down, left, right, into the page, out of the page? Get a lot of different answers, which is good. The most common answer is down, and that is correct. If I place this, this object right here, then I'm gonna have a force that's down, like this. Because it's repelling, yes. That would be the direction of my force, right? Okay, that's the direction the force would be if the charge was there, okay? Now if I take my test charge and I move it here, let's move, I'm gonna move it up a little bit. 
what's the direction of the force going to be when it's here? To the right, exactly. So we come in here and we'll draw a vector, and we'll draw that vector pointing to the right. That's the direction of the force when it's at that location. And I'm gonna pick one more point. I don't know if I would be able to get this out of here without moving everything, that's right, okay. Let's just take this out. Let's move this. Let's move this over here. Let's copy paste it. And then what I'm going to do is we know it's a test charge now. So when we put it here, we got a force. And that force was. To click red, then I click the shape, then I click this. At this location, the force was like this. And there's my force. get these guys out of here. I don't want it to stay there. Okay, there we go. And then if I were to place it, let's say right here, what would the direction be? Is it going to be toward the charge, away from the charge, down to the right? It's always, it's always away. It's always away from the charge, right? It's always away. Because the test charge is positive. All right. Now, now we ask the following question. Suppose that we take the charge away. Now, Having drawn all of these lines here, we know that even before we put the chest charge in that position, right, we know that there's going to be a force there. And in a way, you know, we could draw these force lines all around my object. And no notice that they're all doing the same thing. They're all pointing radially outward from the charge, right? In fact, without even placing the charge there, if I were to come to a position right here, I know that I need to draw a force vector this direction because if I were to place a charge right at that location right there, that's the direction the force would be, right? Same thing as if I came over here, the force would be left. Up here, the force would be up, right? You get these lines always pointing radially outwards. So if that's the case, then maybe there's a way that we can talk about electric forces that doesn't involve Coulomb's law, that doesn't involve two charges. Maybe we can talk about charges in such a way that you only have one, one charge and we describe a field Think of it like a force field in a way. It's like a force field. We can describe a field of points around this object and describe the strength of the electric interaction when a charge is placed there. How big would a force on a charge be if I were to place it here or here or here? And that's ultimately what the electric field answers, okay? It says that at every one of these locations, there is something called an electric field, E. And I'm gonna, everywhere we drew one of these lines, I'm just gonna draw an E, I'm replacing the F's with E's, okay? Before they were forces, now they're going to be what we call electric field vectors, okay? The electric field is a vector, okay? And what it's equal to is you take the size of the force. Why is it? Oh, no. One note crashed. All right. Um, so you take this, what the electric field is, is you take the size of the force that would be placed on your object, and you divide by the test charge. That's it, that's what the electric field is. You take the force, the electric force, and you divide by the size of the test charge. So let's go back to our, our first position here. Let's put our charge at this location, right? And I'm telling you that the size of the electric field at point P, at this point, the size of the electric field is equal to the size of the electric force divided by the test charge. The test charge, after all, is our, our, our test thing. It's the thing we're measuring this thing with. So what is this equal to then? Well, the electric force between positive Q and Q naught, right, should be equal to, according to Coulomb's law, K times one charge, okay, one of the charges is capital Q, they're both positive. The other charge is Q naught, right? We have to divide by the distance between them squared, so we have to know this distance, which is R. So we divide by R squared, but that's just the numerator, right? All of that is the numerator, that's Fe, and we have to divide that by Q naught. So what we end up getting is, and all I've really done here really is, is just the magnitude. We'll talk about the direction in a second. Um, we get that the size of the electric fields at this location, the magnitude, if I do kq q naught divided by r squared and I divide by q naught, well, the 
Q-naughts are just going to cancel, right? This one's going to cancel with this one. And what we're left with is just K times the source charge divided by the distance to the point P squared. And that, which is going to be something that you will see show up over and over again for the first four weeks of this class, this is the electric fields of a point charge. Notice that it's not the same thing as force. It doesn't have the same units as force. It's field. Now they sound really similar, right? You've got electric force, you've got electric field. You have to distinguish between the two of them in your brain. The electric field is produced by a single charge, this charge Q. And at any position that we choose to go, the value of the electric field, the size of the electric field is proportional to the charge. So the bigger that the charge is, the bigger the field's gonna be. And then it's inversely proportional to R squared, the distance away. And that's electric field. This concept is very complicated, or it seems like it's a comp concept that's very difficult for students to understand. So I'll just stop for a second and see what kind of questions you have. And I'll try to answer them. I'll go into more detail about this and we'll do some calculations, but I just want to talk about the concept first. Can the electric force be found from the electric field? Absolutely, it can. Absolutely. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's the next part of this. Take this equation right here, and if you look at the first piece of it, Yes, the units are newtons over coulombs. Yeah, we'll talk about the units in a second. We'll, we'll, we'll derive units from this. So then, if you look at that equation right there, that tells us that if I want to find the electric force, that's really easy. All you have to do is to multiply by the electric field. And I just forgot, if you actually write it in vectors, this is an exact relationship. Yeah, at any point, this defines what the electric field is at any point. Yes, exactly. Can the test charge be negative? Sure. Now the test charge, okay, gotta be careful about this. The test charge is a, the test charge is a, it's a measuring device. It's a, it's a way of probing the field. So, when we're talking about the test charge, Stefan, or Stefan, we always use a positive test charge. Now that doesn't mean that you can't put a negative sign in here. What I mean is, I tell you, we, we learned from what we just talked about, does everyone agree, that at this location right here, according to our definition of what the electric field is, we learned that the electric field points down right here, right? So suppose that I take a charge and I place it at this location. And let's say that it's a negative charge, okay? So right here I place a charge and it has, let's let's say it's equal to two or negative two uh, nano coulombs, let's say, for example. And let's say that the electric field at this location happens to be equal to, um, let's just, let's pick a number, okay? 50 newtons per coulomb, okay? So I place a negative charge with a charge of Q equal to negative two nano coulombs in a place and I tell you that the electric field at that point is 50 newtons per coulomb. If I want to find the force, I just use that equation right there, okay? So that tells me that the force on this particle would be equal to negative two nanocoulombs, and we need to multiply by the electric field. In order to write the electric field as a vector, though, I would need to multiply this, and I'm going to multiply it by negative j hat. So we're going to put a negative sign here. We're going to put a j hat. Hopefully that makes sense. It's because it's pointing down, okay? and we're using just our normal x, y, z, so x is this way, y is this way, that would be negative That would be negative j hat there, right? So the force acting on this, according to my equation, I can find the force by taking the charge and multiplying by the electric field, right? So I take negative two nanocoulombs, and I multiply by, let's use the same color, the size of the electric field, which I've written as 
negative 50 newtons per coulomb times j hat. The negative sign here is just pointing in the direction. That tells me that the size of the force on this particle should be equal to, well, there's a nano here, so it's gonna be 50 times two is 100. So I think it's gonna be 100, negative negative is positive, times 10 to the negative nine um, newtons. Notice the coulombs will cancel, right? And this would be multiplied by positive j hat. That means the force acting on this object, even though the field is down, the force is up. Now, does that make sense, Stefan? Okay, you're saying it makes sense, that's good. Does that make sense to everyone else? I didn't wanna jump into the negative sign stuff too quickly, but might as well, I mean, it's, it's a reasonable question. So notice with this equation, with this equation, there's no absolute value sign. It's just the charge. That means that if I have an electric field, I take the size of the electric field, I multiply by the charge, and the direction will come out right as long as I, as long as I put the right sign in for both of them. You know what I mean? Okay, we, there was other questions here as well. Tom, we asked, why is the electric field defined as the force divided by the charge? Okay, I'll give you an analogy to, I think I've answered all, yeah, I think I've answered all the questions. So to answer Tom Bui's question, your question is, why is this the definition, right? Why would we define it like that? And I'll just say that it's because that's how we define um, force fields, okay? And I'm gonna give you another example. So we saw just there, right, that if I wanted to talk about the electric field around a point charge, you're gonna see this picture show up a lot, so might as well get used to it. We found that the electric field for a point charge creates lines, we're gonna call these electric field lines, that look something like this, right? We said this is what the electric field of a point charge looks like, right? A bunch of arrows pointing away from the charge, right? Okay, that's electric field, right? Let's talk about gravitational fields. You all have heard the expression gravitational field before, I think, probably, right? That we know that Earth has a gravitational field. What does the gravitational field of the Earth look like? Well, it looks something like this. Here's the Earth. It's a circle. If I put, and we can use the same kind of idea. If I were to place a piece of mass right here, what direction would the um, would the force on it be? This is Earth, by the way, the E for Earth. If I were to place a piece of mass right here, what would the direction of the force on it be? It'd be towards Earth. Okay, what if I, what if I came over here? What direction would the force be? Towards Earth, it's always the same answer, right? Okay, this is interesting. So look at what this one looks like. They're really similar to each other, actually, right? They're extremely similar. They're almost exactly the same. There's one difference, which is that for the positive charge, the electric field lines point away, but for the Earth, the gravitational field points towards the Earth, right? Okay. In fact, we can go one step further. I can tell you that if I were to put a negative charge right here, the electric field would look like this. This is what the electric field of a negative charge would look like, because after all, the electric field answers the question, if I were to take a positive charge and I were to place it right here, what would the direction of the force on that positive charge be? Well, it would obviously be attracted to the negative charge, right? So we make the electric field point towards the negative charge. Now, I'm saying a lot of things all at once here, so just try to stay with me because I will drive it home and I hope we'll get to a point that I can actually answer the question you asked, Tom, right? Now, coming back to the gravitational field of our planet, right? Coming back to the gravitational field of our planet. Suppose we go closer to the surface of the Earth. What does this start to look like? Well, near the surface, it no longer looks like a bunch of lines that are coming in radially like this. It starts to look like straight lines. Near the surface of the Earth, this is what the gravitational field looks like. Would you all agree? Where every one of those arrows represents the direction of the force that would be felt if I were to place a mass there, right? I place a mass right here, it feels a downward force. A, a mass placed right here, does it always travel straight down? Well, no, because if I throw it in this direction, it will fall towards the Earth. But that's consistent with the fact that there is a gravitational field near the surface that points down. In fact, we can go one step farther and we can even define the gravitational fields. Let's define the gravitational field to be little g, like this, right? I can even write down exactly the size of the gravitational field of the Earth. We know the gravitational field of the Earth creates an acceleration near the surface of negative 9.8 meters per second squared times j hat, right? 
j hat, where negative j hat means it points toward the surface, right? If you don't remember, just as a, as a, as a refresher real quick, if I have a coordinate system, I can define positive i hat to go up, positive j hat to go up, and k hat to come out, x, y, z. It's our method of creating vectors. We call these unit vectors, in case you don't remember. You might want to go review unit vectors. Regardless, would you all agree that this is the gravitational field of the, of the, of the Earth? Uh, electrons and stuff are affected by gravity. We're not. That's not why I'm talking about this, though. No, hey, don't get confused. That's not why I'm talking about this. Electrons are affected by gravity, but it's not really super important because it's going to be, it's going to be really small. Anyway, but you are right. So the gravitational field of Earth, it points straight down. This is what the value is, right? Now, what do we use fields for? We're going to use a field to find a force. Okay, right? So we can basically take the field and we can find a force. And how do we do this? How do I find the force placed? on an object, like let's say I place a mass right here, and I tell you that the mass has a mass of 10 kilograms, how do I find, from the gravitational field, how do I define the force? What equation can I use? Not ma, not ma, no, 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 mg, there you go, m times g, m times g. And if I write it like this, it'll come out correct, right? Meaning, if I plug in my numbers, the force acting on this object is the phenomenon that we call weight, also known as the gravitational force. And the gravitational force is equal to mass times gravity. In this case, you would take 10 kg, you multiply by the gravitational field of the planet, which is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. That's the gravitational field at the location of the surface of the Earth. And you get an answer of 980 newtons. But you'd also have a negative sign and you'd have a J hat. Because after all, it does point. Oh, you see, you see it, Tom, you see it. It's very similar, right? Because after all, now what we can do is we can kind of, we can come back to uh, what we were trying to prove, which is that the definition of the gravitational field of our planet is actually, yeah, this happens to be the answer, but the really, the reason why that's the answer is because this is true. The gravitational field is equal to the gravitational force divided by the mass. And you can compare this to what we just said above, which is that the electric field, right? The electric field is equal to the electric force divided by not the mass now, but by the charge, but by the charge. So you see how they're the exact same thing? Exact same idea. All right, so when you think electric fields, when you think electric, yeah, you want me to come back up here? When you think electric fields, you should be comparing it in terms of your own experiences. Um, oh, is it blocking something? There we go. When you think of electric fields, you should think of gravitational field. That's how they're related to each other. But don't confuse it with force, right? Gravitational force is weight, right? But gravitational field is negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Those are, the, those are what they are. All right, so I said that we would uh, talk about the units and we should. So let's take our definition of the electric field here. Let's copy it down here so we have some room to work with. Remember. What is this? This is the electric field of a point charge. That's what this is. Right there, let me change the order real quick. This is the electric field of a point charge, the magnitude, right? We'll define it more specifically in a second. Let's find out what the units are. For units, what we know is that the unit for K is in Newton meter squared over Coulomb squared. The unit for Q is always going to be measured in coulombs, C for coulomb. R is always going to be measured in meters, so then meters squared there. This is the same thing you can see <coughs> as one of the coulombs cancels, both of the meters cancels, and we end up getting newtons per coulomb, as someone correctly said in the chat. So this is the unit for the electric fields. Of course, it has units of newtons per coulomb because it's defined as force, which is in newtons, divided by Q, which is obviously coulombs. Okay. Okay. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of vector stuff. I always found, personally, that this made things more confusing, but I know in the past that for some students, this does make things simpler. So let's, uh, let's be really precise about this right here. So let's start off with a little charge. We'll make it red. 
it's going to be positive again. There's our source charge right there. Right? And if I come to some random position, like let's say that I come to some point right here, and we call that point P, we can ask the question, what is the electric field equal to at P? And now what I want to do is I want to include the vector notation. I want to, I want to include vectors in this. Because the electric field is in fact a vector, it's a vector field. If you've taken enough math or if you've heard that expression before, the electric field is a vector field. I'll, I'll define what a vector field is here in a second, but um, let's define the, the vector nature of it first. Okay, so I come to some point P. First thing to ask is, what's the direction of the electric field at that location? What do you all say? Is it down to the left, up and to the right, up left, down right, left right, up down? What, what, what do you think? What's the direction of the electric field at point P? Up and to the right. Everyone's starting to say the right right answers. Northeast, also a good answer. So we basically, we try to draw a line directly from the center of the charge out to this point, and then boom, we've got our electric field vector. Now, the reason why it's a vector field is because I can come to any point, like I can come over here, and I know that I can do the exact same thing, right? I know over here it points this way. I know if I come up here, it goes that way, right? So, so we know what it is. We know the direction. We also know how the magnitude is defined. Let's see if we can bake the direction into our definition. Now, something that you're going to see show up a lot in this class, and you're going to have to start getting used to, is radius vectors or position vectors, however you want to call it. Now, if I draw a line from the source charge out to here, I can label that as a vector. Now, I'm going to call it either a radius vector or a position vector. I think the more proper definition is that it is a position vector. Meaning, a position vector uses two numbers to describe the location, two or three numbers to describe location, right? So for example, this position vector could be something like, um, what does it look like in this picture? It looks like you go to the right, like maybe four units and then up two. It could be something like this, four meters times I hat, plus um, two meters times J hat, right? Meaning it basically just describes a point in space. If this point has the location of four comma two, then that would turn into that position vector, right? Would you all agree? If it was four comma two, that it would turn into this kind of a position vector right here with the M's representing meters. You just need two numbers. Now, if we were looking at, a th if we we're looking at something in three dimensions, we would need three numbers, right? An X coordinate, a Y coordinate, and a Z coordinate. But anyway, so that is a position vector. Right? It tells you the location of where the object is. Now, interestingly enough, the magnitude of that position vector is the same thing as what shows up down here in the denominator, right? The R is the magnitude of this, right? So we can write this in the following way. We can say that the electric field is going to be equal to K times our charge. Now we have to divide by, let's be really specific about this, the magnitude of R squared, right? Now, this quantity, as I have written it down so far, is this a vector as I've written it down? Just look at the right-hand side. We want it to be a vector. My question is, is it currently a vector? K, not a vector, right? Q, is charge a vector or a scalar? I don't think we talked about this. It can be positive, it can be negative, it can be zero, but can it have a direction? Can't, right? It's just a size. You have so many coulombs. It's a scalar, right? Okay, so we got a scalar times a scalar. Now, the position vector is a vector, but why did I write it like this? Why did I write it as these these the magnets? Remember when you write two lines around this, we wrote it's it's now become a scalar basically, right? When you when you put these lines in, well, so why didn't I just divide by the vector? Would that have worked? Why didn't I just put a vector down here? Why don't why did I know that I needed to put the ma the magnitude of the vector? That's what these lines mean, by the way, in case you don't remember. Just as a refresher, if I take a vector and I write lines around it like this, this means the magnitude, only the magnitude and not the direction. You've taken away the direction, you've erased it from existence. Why didn't I just divide by R then? Why didn't I just divide by R? Can I do that? Can I divide by a vector? Yeah. 
You cannot. It is not mathematically allowed operation, not a mathematically allowed operation. What are the things we learned about in this class? And maybe you, you probably also learned these in, if you took vector calculus, you may have learned this as well. There are different types of things we can do with, with vectors, right? We can add vectors, that's not a problem, right? I can take two vectors and I can add them together, right? I can take, let's say my weight's 200 pounds, and let's say I take up, pick up something that's 50 pounds. Those are two vectors, they both point down. If I stand on the scale, it's gonna say 250 pounds, right? No problem, we can add vectors. Uh, we can subtract vectors. We can multiply vectors. In fact, we know two different ways to multiply vectors, right? You can have the dot products and the cross products, depending on how it's, how it's done. We can also multiply a vector by a scalar, which means we can divide a vector by a scalar because you can multiply by like a half, right? But we cannot divide vectors as Jazz was saying. It is not defined. Just like dividing by zero is not defined, dividing by a vector is also not defined. So because of that, I have to do this. Anything I put in the denominator, I have to put the magnitude symbol on. So then the question becomes, how am I gonna turn this into a vector? And the answer lies in, I'll give you all a chance. Any ideas? How do we make this into a vector? What can I multiply by? I can't multiply by a quantity like 10, 20, 30, or anything like that, but I can multiply by, as Alicia said, by a unit vector. So I can multiply by, as yeah, exactly right. We can multiply by r hat. In case you don't know, r hat is what we call a unit vector, and it, it's, it's actually directly equal to taking r and dividing by its magnitude. Now, when you take a vector and you divide by its magnitude, you're guaranteed to get a, a vector that has length one, right? Guaranteed to get a vector that has length one because when you divide by the magnitude, well, if, if the length in the numerator was 10 meters, and you divide by 10, now you have a vector that has a length of one meter, meaning it's a unit vector. But what you've gained is the direction of R. That's the key thing that you've gained here. So let's draw on our picture. Uh, the only thing that's gonna show up is probably like yellow. And I'm just gonna draw a little tiny line right here. This is gonna be really hard to see if I draw in yellow. We're not gonna use yellow, even though it's the only one that's gonna show up really well. Here, undo, delete. How can I get this off here? Delete, all right. So I guess green will show up, okay. All right, so go to shapes here. I'm gonna draw it a little longer than it's probably necessary. That vector is R hat. So it contains all of the information about the direction of R right? But none of the information about the length of R. And it turns out that if you do that, then you've completely defined the electric field at all points in space around a point charge. That's really powerful. So magnitude of the, of the electric field is like this. Direction is like this. And given that definition, you know, just to relate it back to the force, you can always find the force by taking the charge times the electric field. And I think it's time we do a problem because we've we've set everything up. I think we have time to do one quick problem. So, anyone have any questions? In the interest of quickness, I think we're going to use the information that I have here on the board. But do you all understand why that will actually produce not only the size of the electric field, but it'll also give you the direction? Now, that being said, you still have to put this part in. That means you need to find what R hat is and plug it in. So just keep that in mind. So the first equation that we derived on the previous page, that is for a singular point charge. This equation is for the entire electric field. They both refer to a single point charge. Notice the equations oh. are exactly the same. Yeah. Um, what I'm trying to say is that this will tell you, no, this. so let's go back. This equation tells you magnitude. This equation has magnitude and direction. That's the only difference. Okay, I see. Thank you. Now the reality is, just so you know, almost always when you're doing problems, you're pretty much gonna be dealing with just the magnitude portion. Haiti says, when we're stuck with having both vectors and a scalar, we have to do the R hat. Yeah, that's right. Exactly, there's no other choice. There's actually another way you can write this, where basically you just plug this in right here, and you get R over R cubed. So that's another way to do it. That's, that's the way a lot of people do it too. You'll see that in some textbooks. All right, so we have to take a break soon. So we're just gonna use the information that's given here and we're gonna say let capital Q, our source charge, be equal to six microcoulombs. All right, and we'll use these distances here, but let's, 
these distances are awfully big. So let's make them centimeters. Let's scoot this over a little bit here. We'll make these centimeters. We'll make that centimeters. And we'll make the other one centimeters as well. So we have uh, a point P that is located at the point four comma two, right? So in inherently here, we're saying the X direction is this way and we're saying the Y direction is this way, right? And at the, at the location four comma two, where it's four centimeters and two centimeters, we have a point P, we're gonna say let Q be equal to six micro coulombs. And then we're going to find the electric fields at point P. When I write it like that, I mean the electric field at P. Is that enough information? It is. That's what we're gonna do first. And then the second thing we'll do is find the force on Q equal to two microcoulombs. And we're gonna put two different charges at different times there. This will be part C and Q2 equal to um, five microcoulombs. So that's what we're gonna to try to do. We're gonna do this calculation here. Do we have enough time that I can like let you try to solve it? Now technically we started at like 220, closer to 225. So I think it's fine if we go 10 more minutes, which means I think I have time to let you try to solve the problem, which I prefer. So take a few minutes, does the, does the setup make sense? Given a point charge, place into a coordinate system like this. I have an object that's placed at, the, at four comma two, where these are in centimeters, I'll fix that make it centimeters. We want to find the electric field at point P, magnitude and direction, however you want to put it. You can either write it as a magnitude and a direction with an angle. You can write it as a magnitude and direction with a vector. However you want to do it, write down the electric field at point P. We'll probably do it both ways. And then find the force placed on either of these charges when placed at P. Does the question make sense? And does, have you, do you have enough information here to try to solve it? I mean, I know you have enough information. The question is, do you feel like, based on what we just talked about, that you could try to solve it? Yeah? No? Yeah? Okay. Give it a shot, and I'll give you like five minutes, okay? No, it's not, Haiti, because these lines, remember, this means the magnitude of the vector. This means the magnitude of the vector. So that means you have to take the vector, and how do you find magnitude? You use the Pythagorean theorem, right? You take four squared plus two squared, you take the square root. You gotta convert it, but that's, that's how you found the magnitude. It probably wouldn't hurt. It wouldn't hurt for me to write that down, right? Just, just, just real quick, just to kind of reiterate here. Our magnitude, in this particular case, we added the R hat so that the direction could show up, Haiti. So the direction shows up, that's why. The R hat points away from the charge, so it guarantees that the direction of our electric field will be properly defined. Just as a way to remind you all, in case people have forgotten, I wouldn't be surprised. The definition of R hat is you take the X component squared plus the Y component squared. So in this particular case, that would be like 0.04 meters squared plus 0.02 meters squared, and then you square root it. That's what R that's what this means. And I'll let you figure out how you write down R hat based on that, okay? All right, give it a shot. At the very least, at the very, very least, try to figure out what the magnitude of this is and the magnitude of the force is. The, so just find, if, if you can't figure out how to do direction, that's fine, just do the magnitude at the very least. And I'll give you like four minutes, maybe five minutes.
Oh, and, um, you know, if you get an answer, don't put it in the chat until after, uh, after I ask. So we'll, what I'll do is we'll, I'll let you all finish the problem, then I'll ask you to put answers in the chat. So just wait on that. But you can feel free to ask questions, of course. So at the point charge, we don't find the magnitude of R. Um, no, that's not, no, that's not true. Because the other way to write the magnitude of this is just to write it like this. This is, this is something you have to get really comfortable with in physics, the way that things are written. So in a textbook, a vector is sometimes written just with a bold vector, or a bold, they make it bold. Sometimes they put a line above it, but but when I write little r with no lines on both sides, I mean magnitude, and so it means the same thing in your textbook too, because who wants to write the these extra when you can just write r? So when you write this with no vector symbol, that means magnitude as well. Okay, just a notation thing. Thanks for asking, because I I never know what you're comfortable with in terms of notation. Probably like two or three more minutes. It's already been four, but I've been talking, so. Okay, that was about seven minutes or so. Was that enough time? I hope so, because we kind of have to keep going. 
I'd give you all, all the time in the world if we had it, but there is a limitation here. So, um, yeah, let's let's see if anybody has an answer. Can it, if you got an answer for part A, can you type it in the chat? However you however you got it. Magnitude and direction of the electric fields. What is it? That looks correct. Uh, it's kind of big though. Is it supposed to be ten to the negative fifteen? Even then, maybe I should have for. I forgot. Maybe I should have reminded you all what uh, this is. Probably should have written that down, although you kind of got to start to... But you got it in I had J hat notations. That's really good copy. Anybody else get an answer? All right. I can understand if this wasn't enough time. It's a brand new concept. And even if the equation itself is doesn't involve a lot of variables, because it involved vectors, I know that that immediately starts to confuse people. But nonetheless, it's a good way to start. So 3.6 is your answer, okay. All right, let's see how, let's see what we get. The micro, is that what it, that, I was gonna say, I bet you anything it was this that, that, uh, that you did copy. Okay, nice catch. You figured it out yourself, that's even better. Okay, so. Let's do the calculation. So according to this, we need some things to do this calculation. And let's do those before we do it. We know we need a K, we need a Q, we need an R. Well, we've got R right here. And we need an R hat, so we're gonna have to calculate that. So let's find what R is first. What do you get when you calculate this? I should have used uh, just three, four, five to make it easy, but I didn't, so here we are. This is gonna be. Okay, I got. 0 0.0447. And we'll, we'll put it up to that number of places. Yeah, I bet that's the right answer, Daniel. I bet you anything that's the right answer. Okay, because uh, you reduce it by a power to the negative 6, and that, that sounds right. So this is what R is, right? We've got that. We also need to know what R hat is. So R hat is equal to... Well, this isn't even really that hard to do, because we already have... R that was given and we just calculated the magnitude of R so putting that together R is 4 centimeters plus 2 centimeters so it's 0 0.04 I hat plus 0 0.02 J hat that's in meters and we're going to divide that by the magnitude 0 0.047 oops, 47 meters and that will give us, kind of running out of screen room here, but I think we're okay. So I take 0.04 and we divide by that number. And we take 0.02, divide by that number. Oops, 0.02 divided by 2 divided. Then we get these. So we got 0.89. So that's what r hat is equal to, and I'll write it again down here because that's probably hard to see. r hat is equal to 0.89 i hat plus 0.45 j hat, and that's measured in meters. Okay, notice that r hat is a vector. This is not, but that's fine. So our goal is to find EP. I'm busy right now, sorry. Why is there someone at my door? Go away, please. I'm sorry, I'm busy. Okay, so the next thing we do is we're gonna have, um, to find the electric field, we need to plug it into this equation right here. So doing that, we have electric field is equal to K. K is nine times 10 to the nine, Newton meters squared over Coulomb squared, multiplied by Q, which is six micro Coulombs. Micro is six times 10 to the negative six Coulombs. We divide that by this squared, so 0 0.0447 meters. We have to square that. And then all of this has to be multiplied by r hat. So we multiply it by 0 0.89 i hat plus 0 0.45 j hat. 
because I round these down so much, my answer may be a little bit different than yours, but don't worry about that. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, so putting this all together, we're going to get two different answers, as you all showed. I should really probably be doing this with the online calculator, but I don't have it immediately set up, and I think that uh, hopefully you all can put this in your calculator and you get the same answer. So I get that times 0.89. Huh, I'm worried because you guys got something in the thousands. Did I do something wrong? I don't think so. So I got this. I got 2.4 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 2.4 times 10 to the 7 is what I got. Yeah, it's times 10 to the 7? Okay, good. That's I hat plus the J hat is... times 10 to the 7. J hat. And then all of that would be in the same units of Newtons per Coulombs. Good. Seems like you all got the same answer. Okay. Seems like a lot of work, but it's, it's really just some, you know, working out the kinks. You probably haven't been using vectors a lot over the summer. Uh, you probably aren't super... It's not always on your mind what a what a unit vector is and how to do these calculations, but realistically, all we really did was use our equation, which is k times q. We divided by r squared. That part was easy, right? I want you to focus on this part, because that's the most important part, right? All the rest of it just gives you direction. This part gives you the magnitude. So that's one way you can write your answer. There is another way. So 3.6, what did you do? Did you add them together, Johnny? This plus this? You can't do that. You can't add the i-hats and the j-hats. You gotta keep them separate. You can't do that. If you wanna find the magnitude of this vector, what do you have to do? If I wanna find the magnitude of this vector, what do I do? You do this. You take the x component, square it, plus the y component, and square it. So you'd have to write 2.4 squared plus 1.2 squared. It's okay to take all the other stuff on the outside. Uh, 10, how does the last meter cancel out over here? It's inside of this. Oh wait, it's here. Meter over meter squared, meter squared. Wait a minute. Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I made a huge mistake. I'll, I'm gonna highlight in red the mistake I made. R hat doesn't have a unit. This was wrong. Because to get R hat, we did meters over meters. So there should be no unit here. I'm just gonna exit out to indicate that it was a mistake. And there should be no meter right here. Same thing right here. No meter, my bad. So sorry. Thank you, Brian, for answering that, asking that question. Thank you so much. Very sorry. Yeah, R hat has no dimensions. That was my bad. Um, okay, to continue what I was writing, if you want to find the magnitude, you would take 2.4 squared plus 1.2 squared, and you would multiply by 10 to the 7. Definitely need to know how to do this, because this will show up on your homework. Just to write an answer down to what that would be. It would be, I don't need to do it, because I already did the calculation, because it was part of the calculation I did, 2.7 times 10 to the 7. So this is about 2.7. I see it's getting cut off, so I'll screw it down a little bit. Some of the seven. This is the magnitude of the electric field, Newton's per coulomb. All right, I cannot keep going. I have to keep you all, give you all a break. So let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll solve the last two parts. They are not particularly hard. In case you don't remember, for part B, what we're going to do is we're going to take the force and we're going to multiply it by the charge times the electric field, and that's going to give it to us. That's all we got to do. So let's take a 10 minute break. We'll start again at 35 after 2, so 235.
And when we come back, we'll do some more problems. Uh, let me stop the recording.